Okay, good morning. So today what I'd like to do is to talk about the next topic in chapter six. So on um, Thursday, we were covering the introduction to the nature of light and the energy of photons. Today, what we'll do is we'll look at what's called Bohr's theory of the hydrogen atom, okay? And we should be able to also talk a little bit about the de Broglie wavelength, okay? So let's remind ourselves a little bit is that what we said was that light is actually what we call visible light is an example of electromagnetic radiation. So we have a source which projects energy, right? There's energy that is moving out from this source and we call that radiation. So it could be a light bulb, it could be a star, right? A star is a light source, it could be a supernova, okay? Um, or it could be a bioluminescent animal, that's a light source as well. So the idea is that this energy is moving outward from the source. And this energy is what we call electromagnetic radiation. And it behaves like waves. It has wave-like properties. And what we said were those, we could quantify some of those properties. So one of which was wavelength, which was a measure of how long the wave is, right? So we said that the wavelength lambda with some length of the wave, a measure of its size in some sense. We also said it had an amplitude, right? And the amplitude was essentially how tall the wave was. Okay, how tall it was. And then we said it also had a frequency. We used the symbol F which was the number of vibrations that the wave undergoes. And the relationship between wavelength and frequency was that the longer the wave becomes, right? So this is a long wave right here, the lower the frequency becomes because we said the frequency was the number of cycles that could fit in some period of time, which typically is a second. Okay, so if you only get one cycle there, that's a pretty low frequency, right? On the other hand, if we had a shorter wavelength, then necessarily the frequency gets larger, right? Greater. So we called that high frequency. So this one was, you know, long wavelength and low frequency. This one was short wavelength and high frequency. And we said that mathematically, those two properties were related by the speed of the wave. So the wave is moving, and the speed of that wave is the wavelength times the frequency, where for practical purposes, we will use a value of this speed as being 2.9979 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And then we also said that we have a particle model so we could say that these waves also behave like particles. So we called them photons. And we said that the photons have energy, okay? And the energy of a one photon was this Planck's constant times the frequency. Substituting in this relationship here, we also said it could be HC over lambda, okay? The Planck constant comes up over and over again in the discussion of atomic matter to four significant figures, this is the value of Planck constant. Okay. So that was our discussion on Thursday um, relating these properties of waves. Today, what we wanna do is look at now, we're gonna to go to the hydrogen atom and we're gonna pick the hydrogen atom because it is the simplest atom in the periodic table. The hydrogen atom has only one proton and one electron. So that makes it a pretty simple system. Now there are obviously there are isotopes of hydrogen. There's a form of hydrogen called deuterium, which has one neutron. And there is a form of hydrogen called tritium, which is radioactive. 
which has two neutrons, but all three forms have one proton and one electron. So the idea is you've got a really simple system. You have this nucleus, which is really tiny. And then you've got this electron, which is attracted to the nucleus because it's negatively charged and the nucleus is positively charged. So you've got this little negative charge, which doesn't have very much mass, orbiting this proton, which has a lot of mass. It has a thousand times or actually almost 2000 times as much mass as the electron. So the question came up, okay, well, what type of orbital motion are we observing? This is what people were interested in at the end of the 19th century. So a long time ago now. Um, you know, what, 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 what kind of motion is it? Is the electron doing a simple circle? Is it just going around in a circle? Kind of, you know, simple motion. Or is it more like an ellipse? Maybe it's an elliptical motion, right? And sometimes you even see this kind of image of the atom even today, this idea that the electrons are in these, what we would call elliptical orbits around the nucleus, okay? And, you know, there's evidence that, you know, because planets um, orbit stars in elliptical orbits, at least, with, at least our solar system does, um, that maybe the electron orbits the nucleus and in such, a, in, in such a way. So then you start asking, okay, well, what would be the ramifications if that were the case? Well, there's one problem with it, at least one problem. And one problem is that it turns out that in physics, if you have a charged particle and it's in motion that has acceleration, okay? So this may not seem like acceleration because we normally think of acceleration as going faster or slower, but acceleration is a change in velocity. And so an electron that is right here is actually moving in this direction, right? But now over here, it's moving in this direction. So it's changed directions, right? So technically, that's a change in velocity. Even though the speed hasn't changed, speed is a scalar quantity. Constant or, you know, throughout this motion, the electron is changing its velocity because it's changing the direction that it's moving. As a result of that, it turns out that when you have a charged particle or charge charged particles that are changing velocity, they tend to undergo a phenomenon where they radiate out energy. They will like an antenna. So energy will be radiated out, you know, in the form of photons, presumably, right? And if that's the case, if the electron loses energy, that changes the orbital dynamics and it should move closer to the nucleus. And so what you would expect is, is essentially a cascade effect. It would be positive feedback and eventually this electron would just, you know, spiral into the nucleus and crash into the nucleus and you no longer have an atom. Who knows what that would be at that stage, but that doesn't happen, right? So these atoms are pretty stable. So if that's the issue or if that's true, and we know from electromagnetism that, that accelerating particles will radiate energy and we have the conservation of energy law, this is not a possible model. This model has to be incorrect. So what people did then was they said, well, let's modify the model. And so the first kind of major modification <clears throat> was this idea that you could have what we call stable orbits. Stable, all right? So it's an orbit that just happens to be stable we won't worry about what makes it stable at this stage, but let's just see if it works out mathematically, if, if, if this can predict what's happening. So the idea would be then that you have the nucleus and then you have an orbit around the nucleus where it just turns out even though the electron is negatively charged, for some reason, there's something about the structure of the atom, it happens to be stable, okay? So it's in a stable orbit. Now, Bohr, <clears throat> Niels Bohr was the one that figured this out or came up with this idea. And I, I may be wrong, but I think it was around 1905 that he figured this stuff out or came up with this idea. And what he did was he said, okay, well now let's imagine what the, what the behavior of the hydrogen atom is. So people had been measuring the properties of hydrogen in terms of electromagnetism. And you can do this neat little experiment. It's called a bright light experiment. <clears throat> 
where you take essentially a light bulb, you plug it into an electrical source. So you fill it with hydrogen gas. Okay. Uh, and what happens is when you apply voltage, right? So you have a power supply. And that's going to apply a couple hundred volts or 300 volts or whatever you want, whatever, however bright you want it to get. You apply a voltage. And what happens is the hydrogen actually undergoes a reaction and you get hydrogen atoms. Okay. And they're in the gas phase. Okay. You see these hydrogen atoms. So now it turns out if they get hot enough, what will happen is that energy, that electrical energy in the power supply will be converted into energy into the atoms. And the atoms start absorbing this energy, enough energy to break the chemical bond to make hydrogen atoms. But eventually they start glowing. They start radiating light. Okay, I'll just show it on the right. So you have energy coming out in the form of photons, right? Okay, now keep in mind when Bohr was doing this, even the, the idea of photons wasn't fully accepted, but they did know that it was, en it was radiating the energy, okay? So light energy is coming out of here. So the question then was, let's look at these photons. Let's look at this light that's coming off the hydrogen and analyze it. And it turns out when they did that, they came up with some interesting patterns. What they found was there were very specific wavelengths of energy that were emitted. This is called an emission spectrum. from the hydrogen atom. So you got, I'm just gonna draw a few of them. One of them is at 397 nanometers. Another one is at 410 nanometers. Another one is like at 434 nanometers. Another one is like at 486 nanometers. And then I'll put a couple breaks in here. And then another one is all the way out at 656. I'm just doing this from memory because I've done this enough times. So these are what are called lines. And so essentially what we're saying is that you're going to get some colors here, right? Because remember, a specific wavelength has a specific co color. What we said was 400 to 700 nanometers was visible light, right? And we said that 400 was kind of on the edge of what you could see, and this was violet. Roy G. Biv, right? And we said that 700 was also on the edge of what you could see, and that was red. And if you went lower than violet, you had ultraviolet. And if you went beyond red, you had infrared. So it turns out that these lines have colors. Now, let's see what kind of colors I have here. Let's look at this. You know, it's kind of limited, but let me um, do it this way, okay? So essentially you have violet here. Now it's 397, so some people, you know, might be able to see that, other people might. I don't know how you get violet, actually. I'll put that there. I'll put blue and red together, and maybe that looks like violet. I don't know. Violet is like a purple color, okay? Um, and then 410, same thing, you know, it's, it's Roy G. Bibb. So 410 is like kind of like indigo. So, you know, I, to me in any case, it, it sort of looks like violet also. So you have this 410, I guess I'll write 410 over here. So I'm writing it as blue, but it's not really blue. It's really violet. Okay. And then you get to 434 and that really is blue. Oops. And then 486 is, it turns out to be green. So 486 is green. And then 656 is, um, hold on one second here. There we go. And 656 is red. That's an obvious one. Oops. Yeah, I put a little break there because 656 is actually going to be way over to the right. Okay. So there you go. So the, the, that's what's called the hydrogen spectrum. So we call it the hydrogen spectrum because it comes from hydrogen.
Now, what's really cool, or there's many, many things that are really cool about this. It, as astronomers can use this like to do amazing things because it turns out these colors shift if an object that's emitting the light is moving away from you, the observer. So that means if something's moving away, the, the, the wavelengths change. And, and if they're moving away, it's called a red shift. So all the colors shift to the red. So what this does is it means, you know, because stars are primarily made out of hydrogen, you can measure the spectrum from a star with a telescope. And if those colors are not 397, 410, 434, but they're shifted a little bit to the red. So maybe they're like 398 or 399 and 411 and 412, that means they're moving away from you. And you can actually tell that some parts of the universe, galaxies are moving away from us, even stars, right? So if there's a star that's close to us, but it's moving away, then it becomes red shifted. On the other hand, if they're moving closer to you, the frequencies get higher, the wavelengths get shorter and, and, and they're moving towards you. And that's called a blue shift because it's, you know, the colors are shifting over to the blue. So this gives astronomers an amazing tool to look at motions of light sources around the universe just by looking at the spectrum. And it's all, you know, it's all something you can calculate out very nicely. And so you can figure out how fast they are and then from that, you can actually tell, uh, you know, through some logic and calculations, you can tell that in fact the universe is expanding. And so that's, that was the actual evidence for the Big Bang or is the primary piece of evidence is that everything in the universe seems to be expanding. Space seems to be enlarging over time. And so it must have started at some point and that would be called the Big Bang, okay? So 397, you may not be able to see that. Some people can't see it. Some people even have a struggle seeing 410. Uh, most people can see 434, 486, and 656 without any problem, okay? So that's the hydrogen spectrum. So, so Bohr, Bohr was really curious about this. He said, well, wait a minute, what's causing this? Like, why, why do we get these very specific colors out of the hydrogen atom when we heat it up and we get this emission spectrum, right? So remember, the energy comes in from the electricity, the energy comes out in the form of photons. So a lot of research was done on that, and it turns out there were other lines that are invisible to our eyes. So once people were able to make high quality glass that didn't have as much in the way of impurities, we call it quartz glass. Once people were able to make vacuum chambers that could get the air out, once people were able to develop you know, uh, better sensors, and detectors, they were able to see that there's other lines as well. There's also a bunch of ultraviolet lines, UV lines. And there were also infrared lines. Okay. And so there are a bunch of different series. We call them series. So the, the, one that, the one that I put up here, the one that's in the visible range is called the Balmer series. And each of, these, each of these series of lines have different names. This one's called the Lyman series. Okay. Um, the names are not particularly important, but the point is that there are different lines. And so how do we account for these lines using this Bohr idea that we have somehow stable orbits. And so what he said was actually quite clever. He said that essentially what you are looking at when you see these lines, they represent photons emitted when an electron undergoes a transition from one stable orbit to another. Okay, so I, I'll, what I'll do is I'll draw a little picture here for you. Here's your nucleus. I'm just gonna draw part of the circle. So essentially he said, look, there's, there's a bunch of these stable orbits and one is further and further away from the nucleus. Now, since we have a bunch of them, let's, let's number them. 
we're going to call the one that's closest to the nucleus, we'll call that one, n equals one. So n is just a counting number, one, two, three, four, five. And you can keep going. It turns out that spectroscopists can study this all the way out to as far as you want to go. Okay. And these are stable orbits. So what he said was what happens is the energy of the electricity goes into the electron, causing the electron to move further from the nucleus. So normally it's in the n equals one, but maybe it moves up to n equals three because of the energy of the electricity. So now it's undergone a transition. That's an endothermic process. It takes energy to move the electron further from the nucleus because the electron is attracted to the nucleus. Once it's up there, then what happens? Then he said, what happens is spontaneously, meaning on its own, the electron jumps closer to the nucleus, kind of like falling downhill, right? If you take an elevator up to the top of a mountain, then you go out on the edge of the mountain, you might fall down the mountain, right? That's a spontaneous event. It doesn't take energy to do that. It just happens, right? So the idea then would be that you undergo another transition. So this one is from the electricity doesn't happen on its own. This one does happen on its own. It's a spontaneous process. And then when this second process occurs, that's when the photon comes out. And that means the energy difference between those two states is gonna be equal to the energy of the photon. And that's the key to Bohr's model is that there's an energy matching that takes place. In other words, once the electron is up to this third level, it, there's a limit to what it can do. It, it has to jump down to the second level or the first level, but not in between, right? The, it, it can only go from one stable orbit to another stable orbit, not in between. So that means there's a limit to how much energy can come out of the atom. And that limit would be given by these energy levels here. So what he said was the energy of the photon that gets emitted, right? is equal to the energy difference. So I'll write it as, you know, E final minus E initial. So you, in a sense, when you measure that photon, right? You can measure this, we have a detector. That's what that line spectrum is doing. We're, even though we're measuring the wavelength, we know wavelength is related to energy equals HC over lambda. So if you measure the wavelength, you are actually measuring the energy of the photon. By measuring the energy of the photon, you are actually measuring something about the atom if Bohr's model is correct, right? If it is true that there are these stable orbits and that what's happening is the electron is jumping from one level to another, it's true, you know, we know the end law of conservation of energy is true. If that's true, if this model is true, then really when you measure the photon, you're measuring something about the atom, the energy levels of the atom, not the individual energies, but the difference in energies. It's analogous to what we talked about with internal energy and thermodynamics, thermochemistry. You don't generally measure how much internal energy an atom or a molecule has, you measure the difference. You measure delta E or delta H if you're talking about enthalpy, okay? But it is information about the atom and so, these are called transitions. A transition is actually use that with like glasses. You got a prescription now. Transitions, meaning if you go outside, there's like, you know, a, there's a change in the color of your lenses to block out the ultraviolet light. If you come back in, it gets it changes color again, back to the clear color. Okay, they call it transitions, which is clever. It's a clever name. Um, but the idea is this is a transition. So when the electron goes up, that's endothermic. When it comes out, that's exothermic. Okay. And then there shouldn't really be much of a limit. You know, if the electron's on the fifth level, it should be able to go down to four or three or two or one. It turns out there's statistical analyses you can do to see which ones are more probable. The more probable a transition, the brighter that light's going to be at that particular color the less probable that transition, the, the lighter it's gonna be. So it turns out some of these lines are really bright. You know, other ones are a little bit lighter. And so that has to just do with the statistical analysis of the probabilities of these transitions, okay?
And you know, you can also, when you do the spectroscopy of stars, you can also observe kind of interesting things, which is, for example, you know, light from a star might go through a dust cloud. And what happens is some of that light actually gets absorbed by the dust cloud before it gets here. So it turns out that sometimes these stars are missing colors. Why are they missing colors? It's because there are elements in the dust cloud that's actually absorbing the light from the stars behind it. So you don't see a full spectrum. So that you can use to determine what's in the dust cloud because all of the material that we have in nature is made up of atoms. So these atoms are absorbing very specific colors. It's all really cool stuff. And people can learn a lot about the nature of the universe from all this, okay? So we have transitions. So let me talk just real briefly about the two types of transitions. The first one that we've already discussed is called emission. So emission is where the electron is jumping downhill. Because it's jumping downhill, it's emitting energy in the form of a photon. Now, atoms can emit energy in different ways, but the photon is the easiest way for it to happen. Okay, so there's emission. Then, and think of this as going downhill. The electron's going downhill. Then there's what we call absorption. So when, when a dust cloud is absorbing the light from the star, that's an absorption process. So absorption is uphill. So you can use electricity to make an electron go uphill, but you can also use a photon. If you put a photon in and that photon happens to have exactly the same energy as the difference between these two states, then it can get absorbed. Now there are rules that we won't go over about whether it gets absorbed or not, but the photon can get absorbed. That energy can be converted into the motion of the electron, into the potential energy of the electron as well. So this is uphill. That's called absorption. In the laboratory, you'll do an experiment called spectrophotometry. And spectrophotometry is about absorption where the electron is moving uphill, okay? So still, this, this, still we, for either one of these, we can use this equation that the energy of the photon is equal to the difference in energy between the two states of the atom, okay? So this is very exciting from Bohr's perspective because it turns out his calculations, what he did, he did a very detailed analysis. He said, what's the mass of the proton? What's the electrical charge of the proton? What's the mass of the electron? What's the electrical charge of the electron? He applied physical calculations and was able to actually calculate what the energies would be. We're gonna do that a little bit in a problem, but at, at a level that's much more simple than what he did. But he was able to really match these things up very well and get a perfect, Actually, I don't want to say perfect, an almost perfect match of the wavelengths that were emitted or absorbed by the hydrogen atom experimentally compared to his calculations. They were almost a perfect match. There was a problem, though, that, that led to people looking at other issues, uh, uh, other approaches. Okay. And so there we go. So let's take a look then at um, a problem using this Bohr model. Okay, here we go. So this is the first type of problem on Alex. And it says, we're going to calculate the wavelength of a spectral line from an energy diagram. Okay, so they're putting some cool um, prefixes in here, zeptojoules, right? And zepto is 10 to the minus 21, if my memory serves me correctly. Yeah, 10 to the minus 21. Um, addo is 10 to the minus, was it? Pico is 10 to the minus 12. Femto is 10 to the minus 15. Addo A is 10 to the minus 18. Zepto is 10 to the minus 21. Z, so lowercase z, because there's a zocto that's big, 10 to the positive 21, I think. Um, and there is a 10 to the minus 24. I forget what it is, so, okay. All right, so zepto. Um, take a look at this. There are three states there. So notice this is done in terms of what we call an energy level diagram. So it's not showing the actual shape of the orbits. It's just showing you like energies, 
Okay, so imagine the electron is in one of these levels. According to this picture, it looks like the electron is starting in level B and it's ending in level C. So that's an endothermic process, right? That's absorption if it, if it involves a photon. It could be done through electricity too, but it's already not in the level A. Now, by the way, the, the lowest level closest to the nucleus is called the ground state. Okay, so actually the first question in there is what's the energy of the electron in the ground state? The ground state is the one closest to the nucleus, should be furthest downhill, okay? So if you take a look at that, it's just a nut, you're just reading a graph here, okay? And it looks to me as though the ground state, which is level A, well, it's bef between 400 and 600, right? So you just have to figure out what the units are, 400 or what the divisions are, 400, 440, 480, Nope, looks like it's 50 zeptojoules per unit, per division. 400, 450, 500, 550, 600. Yep, so it looks like it's right at 500. So that would be 500 zeptojoules for the energy of the ground state, okay? What's the energy of the electron in the first excited state? So first excited state is the one just above the ground state. So ground state, first excited state, second excited state. If there were other levels, it'd be third, fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever, okay? What's the energy of the electron in the excited state, first excited state, that would be level B, right? So level B looks like, here's 600. Now remember when you do graphs like these, if it's a linear graph, you want, you know, one square to be 50 here, it should also be 50 here. Like sometimes people make mistakes, they'll do, they'll do a sliding scale. They'll make a difference here 50, and then they'll make the difference here 70 or 80. That, that's not good unless you're doing a logarithmic scale, okay? So B would be 700. So that's 700 zeptojoules, okay? What, um, okay, so if, so I can move this up. if the electron makes the transition shown by the red arrow from B to C, will the photon be absorbed or emitted? Oh, that's obvious, right? If it's going from B to C, that's uphill, so that's absorbed. It's an absorption process. And then, I'm sorry, for some reason. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let me just make it smaller. Oh, for some reason it's not showing. Calculate the wavelength of the photon that will be, okay, so now you want to find the wavelength of that photon. Okay, I'm sorry that it doesn't, oh, there we go. Let me make that one bigger. Calculate the wavelength of the photon that would be absorbed or emitted. Round your answer to three significant digits, okay? So that's just our calculation. So first step is figure out what that energy difference is, right? So we're going from B to C so we're going from 700 zeptojoules up to 1100, 711. So that's a difference, 1100 minus 700, that's 400 zeptojoules, okay? So there's our energy difference, 400 zeptojoules. Okay, so... I'm going to call it delta E. So this would be E C, right? Level C minus level B. Okay, delta E, right? So we said that was 1100 zeptojoules minus 700. By the way, you'll notice that if you get, if you, um, if you went the other way for an emission, you would get a negative, and that's actually true. Emission, the sign of delta E would be negative. It just turns out that way. It's exothermic, right? If the photon, if the electron's jumping down, it emits the photon. That's an exothermic process. Exothermic is um, a negative energy change, right? But that's fine. It's just negative. It's really just telling you the direction the energy is going. Is it going into the atom or out of the atom? Out of the atom is negative, into the atom is positive. Okay, so that's 400 septojoules. Okay, 
Okay, let's just go ahead and put in what Zepto is. This would be 400 times 10 to the negative 21. Okay, and that would be 4.00 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, right? Yep, that sounds about right. Okay, now we want to know the wavelength of the photon. Okay, so the change in energy is equal to, I'm going to write actually this way, the change in energy this way, absolute value, so it's a positive no matter what happens, is equal to the energy of the photon. Okay, now the energy of the photon, we can calculate that by frequency or wavelength. In this problem, they want wavelengths, so it's hc over lambda. Okay. I'll drop off the photon off of our subscript, and we'll just write that wavelength is equal to hc over e, where e is the energy of the photon. Okay, and there we go. We've got the energy of the photon in joules. I'm sorry, we've got the energy change of the atom in joules, but that's also the energy of the photon. So we know the energy of the photon in joules. H and C are just constants. Okay, now you want to make sure it's not in zepto because then you'll have a problem with the units. I will put the units in this calculation this time, just so you can see it. Now this is only four sig figs. Alex will probably want you to have more. So there's your H, 2.9979. There's your C, right? And then your energy was 4.00 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Okay, look at the units. Joules cancel, seconds cancel. You're going to get meters. Now, the only issue is do they want nanometers, right? They may want nanometers, but that's fine. We can do that. Okay, so 6.626, that's H. 10 to the negative 34 times 2.9979 times 10 to the 8 divided by 4.00 times 10 to the minus 19. Oh, okay. It looks like it's 4.97 times 10 to the minus 2467. It should be 7. <laughs> They're picking the hydrogen atom. Well, actually, that's not the hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom would be 4.86 times 10 less. So let's see. So they want, um, I just want to see what units they wanted in. Nanometers. They want it in nanometers. That's fine. Okay. So let's put it into nanometers. So 4.97 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. A nanometer is 10 to the minus 9, right? Nano is 10 to the minus 9. So what you get is 4.97. Now, how do you deal with the powers of 10? You have negative 7 is an exponent divided by negative 9. So you subtract the negative 9 from the negative 7. So negative 7 minus a minus 9 is negative 7 plus to 9. So that's plus 2. So times 10 to the 2 nanometers, right? Our meters are gone. And then 10 to the 2 is 100. So just multiply it by 100, 497. And there you go, 497 nanometers. Now, what color is that? It looks like it's green. 486 is green. 497 is pretty close to 486. So it's probably green. In other words, this atom, as it emits or whatever it is, it could be a molecule too, but if it's an atom, when it emits the light, oh, this is absorption. It's going to absorb 497, okay? Could be an atom, could be a molecule, but, but this problem is really just about can you calculate wavelength from the energy difference of this species, whatever this thing is, okay? And there you go, 497 nanometers. Remember 10 to the minus seven over 10 to the minus nine? is equal to 10 to the minus seven minus a minus nine, which is equal to 10 to the minus seven plus nine, which is equal to 10 to the two, which is equal to a hundred. All right, I just wanted to show you that so you can take a look, okay?
All right, um, let's go back here. Make this a little smaller. Okay. Okay, here's a um, interesting problem. I like it. This one's qualitative. The energy level, I'm sorry, the, this energy diagram shows the allowed energy levels of an electron in a certain atom or molecule. So notice they're expanding it beyond hydrogen. There's four different levels. There's energy on the y-axis. That's an energy level diagram. It's a very common method for representing energy in the physical sciences, okay? So use the diagram to complete the table below. What is the ground state? Oh, okay, well that's easy, right? Remember we said the ground state is the lowest one? This is the lowest one here. So that's the ground state. That would be A. How many excited states are there? That's easy too, right? Ground state is not excited. The excited states are up here. So that would be B, C, D. So there's only three. How many lines are in the absorption spectrum? Now that's an interesting question. So here, let me show you. You could go from A to B, right? Absorption is uphill. So we're only looking at transitions to go uphill. So A to B is one. A to C is two. A to D is three. So there's three. But remember, suppose the electron starts here. It could go to C, that's four. It could go from B to D, that's five. Or it could be here at C and it could go to these. So that'd be six, right? D, there's nowhere to go up. You know, there's nowhere to go up, right? So you can't have the absorption from D. There's nothing up there for to absorb to. So it looks like it's six. Um, which transition causes the emission of the shortest wavelength? Okay. Let's look at it this way. What? Let me rephrase it. What would give us the greatest energy difference? Which transition would be the greatest energy difference? It looks like it's A to D, right? That would be the biggest difference in energy. But then look at the equation, A, E, E of the photon is equal to HC over lambda, right? Over lambda. So if lambda gets larger, E gets smaller or vice versa. If E gets smaller, lambda gets larger or longer. So in this one, they want the shortest wavelength. And then the last question is the longest wavelength, okay? Let me just, I'm gonna stop sharing here and just show you that relationship. So here you go, you got your energy of the photon is equal to HC over lambda. So see how they're inversely proportional? The larger the wavelength gets, the smaller this one gets, okay? So the greatest E would be, when this is the biggest, this would be the smallest, would be the shortest wavelength. And then the smallest E, okay, so the smaller this is, the bigger this is right here, that would be the longest wavelength, okay? So there's your answer to those last two questions, okay? So energy, remember energy is proportional to frequency. That's why sometimes people like to use frequency instead of wavelength is because it's more direct, right? If this goes up, this goes up. Higher frequency gives you greater energy. But many of our machines are measuring wavelength. And that's the issue is that our machines measure wavelength. Now they can calculate, it's not hard to calculate frequency from wavelength, but they generally measure wavelength. It really has to do with this idea that there are two devices. One's called a prism. And the prism is based on wavelength. It separates colors of light. And, and that's essentially wavelength. And then you've got this thing called a monochromator. It does the same thing according to a different physical process, but it essentially separates light. Okay. It separates light um, based on their wavelength. So for that reason, we use wavelength. The direct proportionality is really frequency and energy, okay?
So there you go. All right. Um, and then the third one. Stop sharing. This one, you know, you're going to do a little calculation. Okay. Let me show this one. Okay. Now again, this is good. This one, this is the formula we're going to use for the hydrogen atoms. So. In the previous two problems where we were looking at the energy level diagrams, those weren't for the hydrogen atom. You can do energy level diagrams for the hydrogen, but the actual numbers of 410 nanometers, 486 nanometers, 434 nanometers, 397 nanometers, um, 656, all those colors and wavelengths and numbers are specifically for the hydrogen atom. So now when you look at this problem, this one's gonna be the Bohr, um, the Bohr formula um, this is for the hydrogen atom, okay? Now, let's take a look at the problem. Calculating the wavelength of a line in the spectrum of hydrogen, okay? The energy E of the electron in the hydrogen atom can be calculated from the Bohr formula. Now, here's our little Bohr formula. There's many different forms of this, and it can be derived into different um, appearances, but this is the basis of it. Essentially, what Bohr said was the energy of the electron in the atom is equal to the negative, okay, of a constant, which they call the Rydberg constant. So Ry is the Rydberg constant, divided by n squared. And here's an important aspect of the Bohr model. It is really the first theory that anybody devised for the atom, which is what we would call a quantum theory. A quantum theory is a theory that involves measurable, something that you measure that has limited non-continuous possibilities. Meaning if I say like, you know, how big is a room? A room could be 10 meters long or 9.9 .9 meters long or 9.95 meters long or 9.955 meters long or 9.552 meters long. There's no limit in terms of how much precision you have in the measurement. That's, a, that's what we would call a continuous function. But quantum theory is the idea that, that at the fundamental limit of the atom, at the limit of the atom or a molecule, there are limits in terms of how precise things can be. So essentially Bohr said, look, these orbits are non-continuous. They're non, um, well, they're non-continuous. There are specific values that they take on. N equals one. N equals to not 1.5, not 1.52, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, so forth and so on. So that's what we call a quantum theory. So that's the significance of it. So he said that this quantum number is in the calculation. So if you want to know the energy of the electron, you take this constant R, the Rydberg constant, and you divide it by N squared. It's the negative of it, but you take this N value and you square it. So when we look at the problem here, it says, I'm going to go down to the bottom calculate the wavelength of the line in the absorption line spectrum of hydrogen caused by the transition of the electron from an orbit. It says orbital, it really should say orbit. With n equals eight to an orbit with n equals 11. Now that's going uphill, right? 11 is further from the nucleus. n equals one is the ground state. So if you're going from eight to 11, that's uphill. So that's absorption should be positive. Round your answer. We want the wavelength, okay? So let's take a look. Let's take a look at this problem. I'm gonna write this Bohr equation here. Minus R sub Y over N squared. Okay, now let's, let's look up the value of the Rydberg constant. The Rydberg constant has a value that's typically in reciprocal meters, one divided by meters. Um, let's see, but sometimes it's in joules. So it's 2.17. 987 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. So the Rydberg constant historically was in reciprocal meters or reciprocal centimeters actually. Um, but the, 
the engineers at Alex have made it a little simpler for us and they've put it into joules. So we'll take that if we can get it. Okay. So there you go. Now we're going from, I'm going to use some notation here. We're going to go from N equals eight, right? That's where we're starting off at. And we're going to go to N equals 11. You'll see this notation. We're using an arrow. The arrow is telling you what direction the electron is moving. It's moving from the eighth level to the 11th level. Okay. Those are pretty high numbers. So it takes, it takes a little bit of fancy footwork to be able to do that. That's also going to be, it's going to be pretty crazy wavelength. Okay. That's probably a microwave radiation. <laughs> Let's see. Well, eight to 11. So they want it, yeah, they, we'll, we'll use the appropriate prefix for this, okay? So let's do this calculation here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna calculate the energy of both values. So I'm gonna do E sub eight, meaning the eighth level, okay? Remember the eighth level would be the seventh excited state, right? Because the ground state is N equals one. So, you, you know, the f N equals two would be the first excited state. N equals three would be the second excited state. So this would be the seventh excited state. So minus, and then we're just going to put in our constant, 2.1787. Oh, I forgot a digit there. Sorry. 17987. Most textbooks will round it to 2.18, but Alex makes you go all the way out. There we go. So there's our constant. Don't forget the negative. And then we're going to divide that by eight squared, right? You square it. So eight squared is 64. Okay. It's pretty, uh, n equals eight is a pretty big number. n equals 11 is even bigger. Now notice we're going to get a negative number here, but 2.17987 times 10 to the minus 18 divided by 64. By the way, the, the quantum number is an exact value, so don't limit it to one sig fig because n is equal to eight. It's, 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 it's an exact number, okay? So you get minus 3.4060, how many? One, two, three, four, five, six. So one, two, three, four, five, four, seven, times 10 to the minus 20. Okay, because you're dividing it by 64. So that makes that exponent even more negative. Now let's do E11. This is going to be even smaller because you're going to divide it by 11 squared, which is 121. So minus 2.17987 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. And then we're going to divide that by 121, right? 11 squared is 121. So E11 is equal to, so 2.17987 times 10 to the minus 18 divided by 121. And it looks like it's one, negative 1. 1.80, times 10 to the minus 20 joules. Is that smaller? Yeah, it's smaller, right? Negative 1.8 compared to negative 1, 3.4. Okay, so now we do the difference. So delta E is E final minus E initial. I don't want to put one and two, E2 minus E1, because then you might think, oh, E2 is, is N equals two and E1 is N equals one. No, that's not what we mean. It's the final minus the initial, okay? So that would be E final minus initial, E initial. So our final, it said it went from eight to 11, right? So this is our final and this is our initial. Okay, so E11 is minus 1.801545 minus to minus. So that's plus um, 3.406047. And that's all times 10 to the minus. Remember, they have the same exponent, 10 to the negative 20. So you can just add, you can just put, do the arithmetic with the decimal numbers. And then since they have the same exponent, you can just write times 10 to the minus 20. I'm just factoring it out essentially. Okay. So it's going to be positive, right? 
you're adding a negative number to a positive number, but the positive number is greater than the, the absolute value of the positive number is greater than the absolute value of the negative number. So you're gonna get a positive um, result. So 3.406047 minus 1.801545. And this is nice because you're gonna get scientific notation. 1.60450 times 10 to the minus 20 joules. Now that's not what we want, right? We don't want the difference in energy. We want the wavelength of the photon that gets absorbed. And we know it's getting absorbed because it's going uphill, right? So now we wanna convert this energy difference into a wavelength. Now, if, we, if this had been emission and we got a negative value, if you remember what I said, I said the energy of the photon is equal to the absolute value of the difference in energy of the atom, of the hydrogen atom, right? So even if this had been emission and you had a negative delta E, take the absolute value of it to get the energy of the photon. We're not gonna have negative energies of photons. It would be fine if we did, it's not a big problem, but, but it makes it easier if you don't, okay? So that means the energy of the photon is gonna be again, 1.60450 times 10 to the negative 20 joules. Isn't that cool? Okay, so now we can do the same thing we did in a previous problem. Energy of a photon is HC over lambda. Lambda is HC over E. So that would be 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules seconds. So there's your H, 2.9979 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. There's your HC divided by your wavelength, divided by your E, sorry, 1.60450 times 10 to the negative 20 joules. Joules cancel, seconds cancel, you got meters. Round it to three significant digits, it said. So 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 times 2.9979 times 10 to the eighth divided by 1.60450 times 10 to the minus 20. And it looks like we get 1.238 times 10 to the minus five meters. In this particular problem, they ask you to put it into micrometers. The answer on the side is in micrometers. So we'll do a micro conversion. So wavelength then would be 1.238. That's not three sig figs, that's four. So I need to round it as well. A micrometer is 10 to the minus six meters. Okay, so what do we get? Looks like it's 12.4 micrometers, right? The meters are going to cancel. You're going to get micrometer. It comes out to, um, oh, wait a minute. Is that right? 10 to the minus five divided by W10. Yeah, 10, 10 to the negative five divided by 10 to the negative six is 10 to the one. 10 to the one is 10. So you have 12.4 micrometers or microns. The old name for this would be a micron. Okay. There you go. All right, so delta E, you're using this equation right here for this one. This one is only used really when you're talking about the hydrogen atom. You can't use it for other elements unless they are very specifically modified to mimic the hydrogen atom. You can make another atom mimic a hydrogen atom by removing all but one electron. The whole basis of the Bohr model was this idea that you have a nucleus, which is a little point charge that's positive, and then one electron orbiting it, which is negatively charged. So the Bohr model works for that type of calculation, okay? To get to helium, helium has two electrons. Now you have a three-body system. You have a nucleus and two electrons that are in orbit. That creates all kinds of mayhem in terms of the calculation. And in fact, the Bohr model cannot accurately predict the line spectra from any other element other than hydrogen unless those elements have been modified so that they only have one electron. The Bohr model works only for the one electron system. Okay, and there you go.
So those are the problems. So a couple of them are qualitative, really. And then one of them is, um, a, 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 you know, a real calculation there. Now, what I want to do is go through one more section today. Okay. And that section is 6.4. which is called the De Broglie model. Okay, this is really cool. Um, and the reason I wanna talk about it, there's only one type of problem you have to do, but it's a pretty tricky problem and it's pretty involved. Um, but I wanna give you the idea. So here's what happened. So Borg came up with this theory it was a great theory. He tried to modify it for other elements like helium. He tried all kinds of ideas, very clever guy. He said, maybe, you know, you could, you know, modify this and make them elliptical orbits instead of circular orbits, you know, and then you could start applying this to other elements. Um, it turns out that if you really, really, really carefully study the hydrogen spectrum, this model just doesn't work. It, it can't describe little fine details. It turns out like each of these lines, so like if this is the 397 nanometer line, it turns out if you really study it carefully, it actually, there's two different lines that are really close to each other. And so he, his theory couldn't explain that either. So he tried, he tried, he tried, it didn't work. So he got together with some other guys who are also equally smart and they, worked, they put together a center in Copenhagen and uh, they, they figured out some cool stuff. So one um, issue that came up, one kind of partial solution to this was De Broglie, who wasn't part of that group, but he was communicating with them. De Broglie came up with this idea that if you think about it, you, what, what, what is a photon, right? This is kind of a mysterious thing, right? We know it has energy and, we, and, and Einstein and um, Einstein was able to show that it makes sense to think of the of light as existing as these little photons, these little particles. Um, but we also have this idea that it's a wave, right? We know that it has a wavelength and a frequency, so it also behaves like like waves. So there's a duality in that, right? We call this wave particle duality. So under some circumstances, light behaves as a wave, but under other circumstances, it behaves like a particle. So it's not either, right? It turns out at the atomic level, at the subatomic level, things can behave as differently than we normally think. Sound waves, we understand are waves. Um, but at the atomic level, that wave motion is due to these little particles that are moving, right? So even sound waves are, there's a wave particle duality in that. So De Broglie said, wait a minute. If photons have this behavior that they can behave like either a wave or a particle, maybe electrons and protons and neutrons do the same. So he was able to use some calculations and logic and come up with this equation, which he got really from Einstein. He said that if an electron or a proton or a neutron behaves like a wave, it would have a wavelength, right? Waves have wavelengths. And you could calculate. So, you know, the requirement of this was that Einstein had to have his energy conservation law come out and all that stuff. But De Broglie was able to use it to come up with this equation, which says the wavelength of a, we'll call it a matter wave. So this is for matter waves. Because we normally think of electrons and protons and neutrons as matter, not as waves, but we'll call them matter waves. And what it says is the wavelength of a matter wave is equal to this Planck's constant, max, I'm sorry, um, Planck. I keep pronouncing it Planck, but it's Planck. The Planck's constant, right? This is our constant 
times 10 to the negative 34 full seconds divided by what's called the linear momentum. This is called momentum. And momentum is the mass of a particle or an object, an object, times its speed. If it's moving in one dimension, we can just use speed. If it's a more complicated motion, it would be velocity, okay? So we'll use V for velocity. So the momentum is MV, mass times velocity. Okay, so in other words, if, if you have a matter wave, it has a mass. If it's moving, it has a velocity, you can calculate the wavelength, okay? Now it was ridiculed, people didn't believe it at first, um, but it turns out some people very quickly did some experiments where they actually, what they did was they said, well, waves can undergo diffraction they exhibit this behavior called diffraction, which is kind of like refraction in a sense, from a practical sense. Essentially the idea is this, if you send waves, right, so these are waves, and they interact with something that's close to the size of the wave, like close to the wavelength, I mean, how big is a wave? Well. A wave has an amplitude, but it also has a wavelength, right? So we use wavelength. So if the wavelength of the wave is close to the size of some object, they will interact with each other in such a way that the waves will come off of the object, okay? It's, it's a statistical phenomenon too. So it's not just one object, you have to have a bunch of them, okay? but they will come off at specific angles. So there's an angle it'll come off at. And the angle depends on how big the object is. So these could be atoms, like gold atoms, for example, but it also depends on the wavelength. It depends on the wavelength of the waves. So it depends on the wavelength and it depends on the size of these particles. And so if, the wavelength is close to the size of the particles, then what happens is you get this phenomenon called diffraction. And so you'll get the waves will diffract off at specific angles. Okay, so if I change the wave, I make it a different wavelength, we'll get a different angle. If I change the size of these particles, we'll get a different angle, right? That's a wave phenomenon, it's not a particle phenomenon. Okay, so what, De, what happened was De Bruyne came up with this idea that, that electrons, protons, and neutrons are actually waves, at least under some circumstances. And people didn't believe it until someone did the experiment. They, they essentially took electrons. So they took electrons and they diffracted them off of surfaces of metals. And they found that they came off at these angles that matched up very nicely with the diffraction law. Okay, so that means they were behaving, turns out they were behaving like x-rays, x-rays um, had the same wavelength. So that means that these electrons actually have wavelength. And if they have wavelengths, that means that they are actually behaving like waves. So De Bruyne was right. He was absolutely right. They behave like waves. And so we have this very simple equation. Oops. Hmm. We have this very simple equation the wavelength is equal to H over P, which is H over MV. The mass of the electron is equal to, oh man, 9.109 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. Okay, there's your mass. So it turns out if you do a simple calculation, you say, hey, let's make the mat, let's make the velocity of the electron. So it's moving, right? Let's make it, I don't know, 100 meters per second, which is a couple hundred miles an hour. That's, that's simple. Then you could calculate the wavelength, right? It'd be very simple. We've got a constant up here. So here's what happens. You get 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. You divide that by the mass, 
times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. It's pretty small, right? Pretty light particle. And then 100 meters per second. I'm just making up 100 meters per second because it's a reasonable number. Okay. So it's not an outrageous number. Like, it's not the speed of light. <laughs> 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 divided by 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31 divided by 100 and you get 7.27 times 10 to the negative 246 meters, which is like a microwave radiation. Microwaves have similar wavelengths. Okay, so what happens then is it turns out that you can calculate very simply what the wavelength of these electrons would be. And they match up pretty nicely with the electromagnetic spectrum. And so if you move them faster, they move to shorter wavelengths. So if they move fast enough, they behave like visible light. Doesn't mean you can see with them, but they undergo diffraction um, like visible light would. Um, that's not, who needs that though? We've got visible light. But if you, if you make them go fast enough, they start to behave like x-rays. And so that means that you can use them to image, to produce like experiments, which image molecules and atoms and you know, atomic structures that are really small. So x-ray diffraction is a nice method, but we can also use electron diffraction and so scanning electron microscopy, transmission electron microscopy are all based on the idea that these electrons accelerated to a high enough speed will behave in such a way that they mimic x-rays and you can create amazing images with them, okay? So what does that mean in terms of the physics now? What that means is they're behaving like waves. And so waves have very different properties from particles. They have wavelengths, they have amplitude, they have frequency, they have speed, right? But particles can also have a speed. But now we're talking about wavelength, frequency, amplitude. These are the sort of the properties that we talk about in terms of waves. So that means that, you know, we have to think of the atom as not having particles moving around the nucleus but having waves that are somehow moving around the nucleus, okay? And that brings us up to that discussion that we had a little bit last week, which was this issue of standing waves versus, um, sorry, standing waves, standing waves versus um, moving waves, right? Traveling waves, sorry. All right, so the waves that we've been talking about were, were traveling waves, but it turns out for the electron, a better model for its behavior is a standing wave. And a standing wave, we said, was what you get when you have a wave that's moving in one direction and then another wave moving in the opposite direction and they combine and they appear, they appear to be stationary. They appear to be standing. They don't move, right? They are actually moving. There's a motion of it, but it appears as though they're not moving. We observe these sorts of waves in musical instruments. So a guitar, a violin, right? There's a certain wavelength. There's a certain length of the string. You pluck it and it vibrates. Drums, so when you hit a drum, it's essentially a two-dimensional standing wave and you get these standing waves, okay? So essentially what, you know, um, Erwin Schrodinger said was that if the electron behaves like a wave, there must be an equation. Waves have equations, they have functions. Let's come up with the fun, let's figure out what it is. Let's start playing around with the mathematics and see what, what type of wave could adequately or accurately predict the behavior of the electron. There's some behaviors that we have for it, right? So that led to what we call wave mechanics or quantum mechanics. 
okay? Now, we're gonna get into that tomorrow, but for today, what I wanna do is I wanna show you um, an interpretation of this de Broglie relation, right? This H over P for the wavelength, and then we'll get into the wave mechanics, the quantum mechanics tomorrow, okay? So let me bring up this problem here. which says understanding the meaning of the de Broglie wavelength, okay? Imagine an alternate universe where the value of the plane constant is no longer 6.626 times 10 and negative 34 joules second, but it's 6.626 times 10 and negative 36 joules seconds. In that universe, which of the following objects would require quantum mechanics to describe? That is, would show both particle and wave properties which objects would behave like everyday objects and be adequately described by classical mechanics, okay? So um, I'm not gonna do all four, I'm just gonna do two of them, okay? I'm gonna do the last two, okay? Let's do the bacterium with a mass of nine picograms that's one micrometer long, moving at four micrometers per second. And then we'll do the buckyball with a mass of 1.2 times 10 to the negative 21 grams, 0.7 nanometers wide, moving at 20 meters per second. Okay. Actually, you know what? Um, yeah, we'll do that. Let's do the last two. Okay. So here's the approach that you want to take. You just have to kind of interpret. What you want to do is you have they're giving you the size of the object. Okay. So notice the bacterium, they're telling you how big it is. It's a micrometer long. That's the size. Then they tell you it has a mass and it's moving. So the mass and the motion, that's the momentum. So they're giving you the momentum, MV, of the object. So what you do is you calculate the wavelength using the mass times the velocity. If the wavelength is around the same size as the object or greater than the size of the object, then the particle will behave like a wave, okay? On the other hand, if you get a wavelength that's much smaller than the size, then it will behave like a classical particle. So essentially what we're saying is everything in the universe has a wave-like property. You can calculate its wavelength but if the wavelength is much smaller than the size, it will behave like a classical particle. So for example, us, you could calculate a wavelength for us, but it turns out the wavelength is so small, it's negligible. But if you change the value of H, H is what determines what the wavelength is, right? It's H over MV. So if you changed H, so if you had a universe where H was very different, that would change the wavelength and you could actually take something that's classical in our universe, it might behave more like a wave in, in an alternate universe. Now, if you behave like a wave, you'd have very different properties. You would actually perhaps be able to walk through a wall. Waves can pass through, you know, they, waves can pass through walls, right? Like sound waves can get through a wall. They vibrate the wall, right? And then they pass through. Um, so that could happen, that sort of thing. In our universe, we can't move through a wall because our wavelength is so short compared to our size, it just doesn't, doesn't behave that way, okay? So the value of the Planck's constant, Planck constant is 6.62607 times 10 to the negative 36 joule second. Now you just have to have the actual values of the mass. Now they, they get you with units in this one. So you're gonna see all kinds of different units for size, micrometers, millimeters, kilometers, same thing with mass. They're going to give you picograms, kilograms, grams. Just bring it out to the MKS system, meters, kilograms, seconds. Make everything MKS so that you can compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges, okay? So let me take a look. Let's um, take a look at, we're going to do the bacterium first. So let's write down our value of H. 
that's not a big difference. It's a hundred times smaller. You know, I don't think it's going to make that big of a difference for most things. It will take things that are sort of on the edge of being quantum. And let's do the bacterium. So what they tell us is the mass is 9.0 picograms. They tell us it's moving, so the velocity is 4.00 micrometers per second. And then they tell us the size is one micrometer long, 1.0 micrometer long. Okay, micrometer, 10 to the minus six. Okay, so how do we, how do we deal with this? Again, put everything in MKS. So let's do the size in, my, in MKS. Size, this is easy. Micro is 10 to the minus six. So 1.0 times 10 to the minus six meters. Okay, so tiny, tiny, right? That's like, it's, it's, it's small. Well, it's a bacterium, right? It's tiny. You probably can't see that with your eye. I think something has to be like 50 micrometers before you can see it with, it, with your eye. Okay. Maybe 100 micrometers. Okay, so there's your, you got your size. That's easy enough. Now we calculate the wavelength, but let's put everything in the MKS system. So H is already MKS. Remember, joules is kilogram meters squared per second squared. So that's already MKS. Um, but the mass is in picograms. We need it in kilograms. So the mass is 9.0 picograms. So pico is 10 to the minus 12. But we got to convert that to kilograms, right? So 9 times 10 to the negative 12 grams. A kilogram is 1,000 grams. So that would be 9.0 times 10 to the minus 15 kilograms. So now it's suddenly a pretty small number, right? In kilograms anyways. And then our velocity is micrometers per second. You know, a biologist is gonna measure how fast this bacteria is we're moving. They'll probably use micrometers per second. But that's okay because we can just get rid of the micro. So the velocity is 4.00. Micro is 10 to the minus six meters per second. So now we're in MKS there, okay? So now we calculate the wavelength. All we gotta do is calculate the wavelength um, using your H over MV and then compare that to the size, okay? So if we have it in MKS, the wavelength will be in meters. So 6.62607 times 10 to the negative 36. I'm gonna put it in kilogram meters squared per second squared. So that's a joule times seconds, joules times seconds, right? The reason I did that is because I want you to see how the units work out. So joule seconds. And then we're gonna divide that by the mass, which is 9.0 times 10 to the negative 15 kilograms. And then we're gonna divide that by the velocity 4.00 times 10 to the minus six meters per second, right? Micro, okay? So let's see what we get. 6.62607 times 10 to the minus 36 divided by 9.0 times 10, times 10 to the, oops, sorry, yeah, 10 to the minus 15 divided by 4.00 times 10 to the minus six and you get 1.84 times 10 to the negative 16 meters. Why meters? Kilograms are gone. One of these meters is gone with that one. Seconds is gone with one of those. And then these seconds and you just get meters. That's still way smaller than the size. So even in this alternate universe, the wavelength is smaller than the size, like a lot smaller, like that's way smaller, right? 10 to the minus six, so that's, that's, that's 10 billion times smaller. It's still gonna behave like a bacterium does in our universe. It's still gonna, it's, the bacterium is not gonna be able to behave like a quantum me mechanical particle. It will be classical, okay? Classical is like, you know, a rocket 
or a baseball, a bowling ball, an earth. Those are classical particles. Okay, so sorry, no good. Um, but what about the next one? The next one is a buckyball. So a buckyball is a, is a C60 molecule. It's a molecule that looks like a, it looks like a soccer ball, C60. And um, so it's, it's got 60 carbon atoms in a little ball. It's kind of cool. Okay. So with the buckyball, they tell us that the mass is 1.2 times 10 to the negative 21 grams. They tell us the velocity is already in meters per second. So thank you. That's already in the MKS system. And then they tell us that the size is 0 0.7 nanometers. Now, buckyball is an interesting thing. It, it doesn't behave quantum mechanically in our universe, but it's actually on the edge. There's this field called nanotechnology where the properties kind of are intermediate. They're almost quantum, they're almost classical, they're sort of in between and people get into that. So this is a molecule which is sort of in between. It's kind of like people have done these experiments to show that they can get it to act like waves and it kind of barely does, but not exactly a little bit, yes, a little bit, no. So if you change the value of H, you can kind of knock it over to the other side. So that's essentially what's probably gonna happen here. So let's take a look. Remember you're gonna divide by a thousand to get from grams to kilograms. So this would be 1.2 times 10 to the negative 24 kilograms. This is already in MKS. And then this would be um, 0 0.7. You just put 10 to the negative nine, that's your nano. And now you've got it in the MKS. You can move that decimal over if you want, but you don't need to. So let's calculate the wavelength. So the wavelength 6.62607 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. We already went through the units. This is gonna work out to be meters. And then your MV would be 20 meters per second. And then your velocity, I'm sorry, your mass would be, that's your velocity, sorry, that's the V. And then your mass would be 1.2 times 10 to the negative 24 kilograms, okay? So see if you put joule seconds, it doesn't look like the units work out, but they really do because joule is kilogram meter squared per second squared. So what happens is, you know, this is all going to cancel out into meters. Okay, so let's see what happens. If we get a wavelength that's a lot smaller than 0.7 times 10 to the negative nine. So if we get like, you know, 10 to the minus 11 meters, 10 to the minus 12 meters, then it's going to behave classically. But if you get a wavelength that's like, you know, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 8, then the size is smaller, right? 10 to the minus 9 is smaller than 10 to the minus 8. Then, then it behaves like a quantum particle. So let's see what we get. 6.6260. We don't really need all those sig figs because we're not calculating the actual value. We're just trying to see how close it is to the size. And you get smaller, it's actually smaller. 2.76 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. Okay, well, let's see. So this one is seven, so there's your size. Seven times 10 to the minus 10 meters. Now that's really close, right? Like, you know, if, if you make them the same exponent, this would be 70 times 10 to the minus 11 meters, right? So, you know, to me, that's still quite a bit smaller, right? It looks like the wavelength's quite a bit smaller. So I would say it probably is still behaving classically. Um, you know, the de Broglie wavelength is still smaller. So it's probably still acting like a classical particle. We're getting closer, right? So in order for this to actually have, have kind of worked, what would have happened is we would have made, probably need, needed to make this, you know, minus 37 
all right? So if you'd made this minus 37, then that would have made this minus 10. And so now 2.76 times 10 to the minus 10 is like, you know, now that's small, you know, it's still smaller than this, but it's really, really close, okay? So even, even with the 10 to the minus there's even the buckyball um, seems to behave like a classical particle, okay? You gotta, you gotta have smaller value of h. So, you know, 10 to the minus 40, now that would make that much, much smaller. And if it were 10 to the minus 40, oh, actually, I'm sorry. Did I, did I put the wrong number? I put minus 34. I meant this to be minus 36. All right. How did I make that mistake? I put it, I just went back to my regular kind of negative 34. This is actually negative 36. So let me, let me try this again. I'm going to erase this. Okay, so it's 6.62607 times 10 to the minus 36 divided by 20 divided by 1.2 times 10 to the minus 24. Oh, okay. So now it's 2.76 times 10 to the minus 13 meters. Okay, now that's actually, that's actually um, quite a bit smaller. I'm sorry. My mistake. So that's still, so the wavelength is much less than the size. So that means it's going to behave like a classical particle. So it's actually got to go the other way. What has to happen is if H is larger, so if H, let's say, is 6.62607 times 10 to the minus 30 joule seconds, right? So it's got to get bigger. If this got larger, then what will happen is the wavelength will get larger, and then you could have a situation where it starts to behave like a, like a quantum particle. Okay, So it's actually got to go the other way. So making this smaller actually made the buckyball behave more classically than it would in our universe. So there we go. Okay, So there's your, there's your problem for that section. As I said, what we'll talk about tomorrow on Tuesday is we'll look at section 6.5, quantum mechanics, 6.6 .6, quantum numbers. So we'll do both of those sections. And then on Wednesday, we'll get into atomic orbitals and electron configurations and wrap that up, you know, Wednesday and Thursday. I guess we'll finish that up by Thursday. We may have a little bit of time at the end of the week to get into chapter eight a little bit to get a head start on that. And, and then we'll get into to the chemical bonding, okay? So this chapter is going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, pretty abstract kind of concepts, you know, because you may not have much experience dealing with waves, but we'll get through it. We'll go through it and um, have a great day. And um, we'll start, keep going into it. Take care.